Hi, welcome to Almost Cooperstown. I'm Mark. And this is Gordon, and we love talking about baseball. Welcome to episode 13 of Almost Cooperstown. Today we're going to talk about rules that have changed the game, and one that hasn't yet taken place, but Major League Baseball has talked about instituting, and that is putting the end to the infield shift. I mean, it, it is it is a bit different now since, you know, the shift is kind of, I feel like, you know, it's more than just the infield moving around, but I have heard them discussing that, or at least talking about wanting to outlaw the shift, you know, as a potential option. And as I um as I look into this, you know, deeper, and, and the shift has been around for a long time, uh, the Ted Williams, the great Ted Williams had a shift specifically designed for him, but it wasn't a regular uh, used thing the way that it did become after around 2010, uh, really regularly. And uh, it, it's very different today than it was, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly the way time. it's being used now is different than the way it's ever been used before. But I think that's more just the game evolving as people go, wait a second, you know what, this is something worth doing against. At least a lot of hitters, there are certain hitters that, yeah, you can kind of count on them to pretty much pull the ball every single time. And and Major League Baseball really was looking at what was bothering them about the game, and that is strikeouts. So strikeouts have gone up markedly uh, over the past 10 years, and the strikeout ratio was something that they think by outlawing the infield shift uh, that they're going – it's 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 not a good theory. Outlawing yeah, – you know, Yeah, I don't even follow that. They're going to be more singles and doubles and, and, and because batters have shown to try to elevate the ball to get it over the shift. This is this is mm. a fact. I mean, I, I guess, but just as much that, like, wouldn't the shift also then e- open up an equal amount of opportunities because, like, there's giant parts of the field that are unoccupied that you could hit the ball into? Well, the players would have to want to hit the ball in, in, into those places, and a lot of players don't. Um, and so it, it, it's surprising that the differences are not that marked between uh, hitting against the shift or hitting without a shift. Uh, it's slightly more favorable to, you know, to employ the shift. This is why they do it from a data perspective. But I, I think it's mainly that there are fewer balls put in play now because there's so many strikeouts. And that's what they're really trying I mean, to address. That is one of the biggest change, just how many more strikeouts. I mean, that's been more of like a recent thing, like kind of like a development of like over the last five-ish years is the extreme amount of strikeouts. But – that yeah, that would have an impact because you're just gonna have so many less balls put in play that the shift will probably have a more pronounced effect. And and I guess it would be whining, right, if you had a bunch of major league baseball hitters start saying, I don't like this shift and I wish you guys would make like, it stop. Yeah, yeah. And I just feel again like there's I would feel more compliment like, you know, more like on the side of the players if like more of them actually used the completely open parts of the field. But I see so many guys that they go up against the shift and they just pull balls right into the shift all day long. And it's like, they kind of are giving you the whole field to use. Like I, I read an abstract from Bill James on David Ortiz and how somebody said, if he just were to have bunted like once every four months, it would have changed the way defenses would have had to play him because they would have had to be a little more honest, which would have given him more room and would have raised his average more. David Ortiz, big pop, he's not bunting. I mean, and like in the thing there there is a difference like because like getting like certain players to bunts is not possible in the major leagues like they just won't do it whereas like I feel like it's a lot harder if you're a hitter to be like oh no I just don't hit the ball to the opposite field like I don't think you can get away with that quite as much as you can get away with like not bunting you know? and and the pitchers uh, and a former pitcher yourself pitchers would know okay well if we're shifting I'm I'm gonna pitch this batter differently than if I weren't yeah and, and certainly which is kind of why I'm surprised you don't see the shift at a lower level more often but I guess probably for like when you're looking at like the high school college level. You just want the guys in the position they're going to be most comfortable in to make the plays more often than not because, like, there's probably a lot of guys in those lineups where it's like it doesn't matter what they do. They're not pulling a baseball off of certain pitchers. I and, think a lot of high school pitchers are just trying to get the ball over the plate. And if they saw their fielders on one side there, they'd flip out. Yeah, that's also <laughs> probably and, and even if you had more fielders on one side of the field, I don't think it necessarily makes them any more likely to make that play, certainly. But – uh I don't know. It just seems like it's the kind of thing that would be useful at all levels of baseball. And it's like, it's like a you can set up your defense in football to, you know, counter a specific area on the field based on where you are. Why wouldn't you do the same if you're the baseball team? Like, why can't you change your defensive alignment? And how random is it to consider shifting the infield uh, or banning the shift of the infield? What about the outfield? We're not going to say our left fielder has to play in a particular little square in there. Like, in the center? Like, is there like a range he's allowed to move within? Like, right. This isn't lacrosse, folks. 
you know, you can't say, oh, no, only, you can only move between this area and this area on the field. Because, like, obviously, even if they were going to say, like, oh, like, what, you can't go over second base? Like, there's an el- like, a, like an invisible line splitting the field in half. It's kind of weird. But at the moment, right, if you're if you're up and it's a, you know, big part of the game and there is the third baseman standing in right field mm-hmm. uh, and somehow you you hit a crack, you know, right through the infield. Would have been a base hit, but it's not because it goes right to him and a 5-3 put out, by the way, from the uh, right side of him. And you, you run back to the dugout and you're pretty upset because you hit the ball hard, very hard. But that's, how often does that happen in general in baseball? We see guys hit screaming line drive outs all over the place. And it's just like... I and we're starting to see guys do it now. Now you're starting to see guys that have the switch, you know, give it put on them against on the defensive side. They're starting to use that opposite field a little bit more. We're starting, and I think as guys get better about it, you'll now see the shift decrease in usage and be a little bit more something you deploy against specific guys because, like. There will be guys that can handle being like, okay, you're going to give me all of the left field. I'm just going to smack singles there all day. But then there'll be guys that cannot do that. Uh, just, there are a lot of guys who don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. <laughs> like, But I think it's important that there'll be there'll be enough of them that come up. You know what? If you're the number three hitter on the team and there's a guy on second and third and no outs, they're not going to put the shift on you if you've shown a propensity to time and time again hit a ball right through that shift. Go the other way. And go the other way. Right, right. And, and, which is why I think it's dumb when you get back to the idea that the Major League Baseball would would change it because I don't think it's having an impact on the game in such a way that, like, when you look at the other really – when you like, there's been three other, like, major rule changes. And certainly in comparison, two of them don't come anywhere close to changing the game they change the game so much more than the shift. You, the, just the impact that some of these changes would have is so much greater than like outlawing the shift. I don't think it would really have that much of an impact. It strikes me more as a, a, a visual change than anything else from the major leagues. Well, you have to go back exactly 100 years for, for what you know, I think is the most major rule change, and that is uh, the end of the dead ball era, which a lot of people think had something to do with the baseball. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in 1920, they did change to Australian yarn uh, instead of American yarn. Uh, they had changed to a, a cork center in 19. 19- 1910, uh, but averages uh, were were not good and home runs were non-existent. And really, what changed in 1920 wasn't the baseball; it was that they outlawed the spitball and and bringing little uh, files onto the mound and cutting the ball in grease and whatnot. And so the, you had eight 400 hitters in 1920, where you had none the year before. You had Babe Ruth hit 54 home runs in 1920, and all of a sudden we were off and running into the 1920s. And, and now and we had the live ball era. Exactly. So I was the ball. And, it, it, it was the ball to a point, but I got I to also think there's such a clear, you know, correlation between the pitchers no longer being able to mess with the ball and cut it up and mark it up. And then all of a sudden averages and home run counts exploding. The fact that as soon as that was outlawed, that like all of a sudden people could hit everything. I can't imagine what it was, you know, how hard it was to hit those spitballs. Right, I think we should, I think we should do this. We have an exhibition game and let the pitchers go out in the mound with a file and see, grease. And let's just see what happens if the guys can hit it. But here's the problem. I don't know. The pitch is like in a lost art form at this point. How would those pitchers know how to mark? Oh, Gaylord Perry's still around. He could teach him. He knew how to do it. Come on. Gaylord won. It was a, is a hall of famer. So uh, I, I think you could probably get someone to give a few lessons on how to do that. Mm. So that was a, you know, a major rule change. And, and, and we're not going to talk about the next. There's really not a rule change. It's sort of the the as as Branch Rickey uh, went against the Jim Crow laws and brought Jackie Robinson in the baseball. That's a giant impact. That's a baseball. giant impact. Not a rule change between the lines. The yeah, that's way. not so changing. We'll, we'll the pass game. on that for yeah. today, but that's a topic for another day for sure. Uh, and then you have to go all the way you know, into 1968, the year of the pitcher, uh, when both Denny McLean and Bob Gibson won the NL uh, and AL Cy Youngs and the MVP. Both of them, both pitchers won There's both Two those pitchers awards. getting the MVP in the same year is kind of unusual. So, like, so Gibson, <laughs> had, Gibson that year had 34 starts. He had 28 complete games. 13 good. shutouts. 13 shutouts. That's pretty good. 1.12 ERA. So Major League Baseball says, okay, this isn't good. I think the teams were scoring like three runs a game. It was just really it, no offense. Anemic. Um, the the Yankees in that year, and we we talk about how great the Yankees are, they were had a worse average than the Mets, which is hard to believe. They had a team average of 214 that Oof. year. The Mets hit 224. Oof. They were the lowest in the National That's, League. So God, it was that two, would make 237 was the league average in 1968. Uh, 
Um, so mm-hmm. Major League Baseball said, okay, we've got to do something. Um, and and that was the last year um, of non-playoff play, right? You just had the American League and the National League. You were going into expansion baseball in 1969. That is interesting, though, that you had those two different kind of things coming together at the same time where you had the ending of the just the straight pennant races right and the lowering of the mound were both in the same season so now you have 1969 the year after the year of the pitcher and what do they do they lowered the mound from 15 inches to 10 inches okay that's pretty substantial when you think about a, a third of the of the height went in there and they also changed the strike zone and I, and I had to look at this this was another you know another I aspect know, I, of I this. knew the first part about them lowering the strike zone I didn't know about them lowering the mount I didn't know they changed the strike so zone they, so what the did they do? recommendation was from the shoulders to the knees uh, from 1968 came to the armpits to the knees in 1969 so they lo- they took a little off the top of the strike correct zone. correct that would have a big impact. Because if you took away that way higher pitch, and you're taking, because because now like you're gonna the, the balls are gonna be a lot. It's gonna make a big impact on what the hitters can do. And and of course in 1969 you added the Mets and the Padres in the National League, uh, and and the uh, I think it was the Royals uh, in the American League. Um, and the Seattle Pilots came in the next year. Um, in any event, no, the Royals were here. My, I'm, 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 I'm confusing something. No, they, they were expansion that year. My mistake. Um, and the, uh, you know, those two, those four teams diluted the talent because yeah. now you had another hundred players playing Major League Baseball. So even then, you, you are you going to get you're going to have lousier pitching because you need more guys to throw. Yeah, yeah, so that yeah. also is going to help. Yeah. So you're going to have certain guys get taken away from those teams to go play on the expansion teams. But those are going to be the best players, and then the guys they bring up. But they're going to pitch because they have to pitch on the exactly. So star in the expansion team. Just have a whole bunch of extra, not as good pitchers in the major leagues, and there's just going to be that many more bats. X number of batters get against guys that just aren't that good. So that rule change uh, of uh, of the strike zone, um, in addition to the mound going lower, is is something that Major League Baseball is talking about. Um, you know, maybe uh, putting the shift in, but some people say maybe we should be thinking about either lowering the mound again, which I I don't think so. I mean, if you lower it much more, it's kind of like they're just throwing off a of flat ground. I, I don't think that's an issue. Right I don't know now. what the impact would be if you took it to twelve inch uh, to to eight inches but from. I don't 10. feel I don't like know. the pitch. I don't feel like pitching is overly dominant right now i think your point is is if you made the strike zone a little bit smaller you'd have fewer strikeouts so you wouldn't have to change anything on i would have to look at how many strikeouts get are i guess yeah because even if even if they're not striking out swinging or striking out looking you would still have less strikeouts if they were less just called overall strikes because the strike zone was smaller. But that that rule change had the added effect. It added a uh, a run per game per team almost. Which is what they really needed because it was, you know, you can't have teams hitting 214 for the season because that's just not interesting for the fans if nobody can hit. So Carl Yastrzemski won the AL batting crown in, um, in 1968. He hit 301. Ooh, that's really, really. <laughs> How do you, 301? Yeah, like... It just doesn't seem right. So, so they they, they were right to make changes. Uh, yeah, I, I, the pitchers were telling you that you know, uh, and Gibson, I think was, was was so that was the year that it all came together for all of us. We all came up to, like there was some some grouping thing of pitchers that they all like. Yeah, we're going to hit our stride in 1968. Marischal is great, and and uh, Steve Carlton is great, and 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 Denny McLean is great, and all these pitchers. So are was great. he trying to insinuate like that, like somehow they had organized that, or was it just like a coincidence? That's what he said. It was a coincidence. Don Drysdale uh, set the then record for consecutive uh, scoreless innings at 56 or so, 58 until Oral Hershiser broke it in 1988. Uh, he also had six consecutive shutouts, which I think is a uh, a nationally record still uh, to That's this pretty day. good he, he was late in his career didn't have a great year pitched to a 215 era yeah like, like it's, <laughs> yeah when a guy when a guy can be described as having a not great year and he pitched to a 215 in you have six shutouts you're gonna probably you know find a way to lower your rewrite right? so you know it, it I think that change was good for major league baseball um, I think it, it helped uh, you know oh. get them where they wanted to go they needed um, to make that change you need to get runs up because that's that was that's part of the reason why they're going on their current Current changes now to shorten the pace of the game, shorten the, the total length of the game. Because it's when the game takes forever and there's no offense, it's not super exciting to watch because it isn't like, say, like soccer or football. Well, more, more soccer, you know, do you compare that? Like, 
and there's a constant fight over position in that game. So even if there's not a lot of scoring, you can still see teams making advan- advantageous mm. like plays and stuff. Whereas there's nobody scoring in baseball, just nobody's scoring. Like, yeah, yeah. The game is slow moving uh, compared to other sports in, in general, and, and to have less scoring without it being artificially high. From, from you know, you know, it's not like we're we're advocating they do things to like goofily increase the runs. But but um, it wasn't enough for Major League Baseball um, in 1969 to you know put in. Uh, the new rules on, on mound height and, and strike zone because in 1973 they decided in the American League that they would be a renegade and they would institute the designated hitter. And now that looks like it's coming in the National League too. Well, it's not coming. It's here. Well, um, as a full-time thing and not just a coronavirus season thing. Yeah, what do you think? Do you think the designated hitter, hitter is here to stay? Yes, because the player union gets an extra job per team in the NL. Yeah, I think so. I think we talked about that in earlier in and our so, rules for the year. Yeah, exactly. So I think they, I think it sticks around. I don't love it, but I'm fine with it at this point. Yeah, me too. Me too. I think that's a traditionalist, if you will. You know, I mean, you know, never again will Zach Greinke win a Silver Slugger award. And I think it does. It. What bugs me is that you do, there is a point of the game, a part of the game you lose where you're managing around the pitcher slot that could be very interesting because. It feels like there's just – it's documented. There are way less bunts in the American League than there are in the National League. And bunting and getting the guy over – What's a bunt? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't – because why would it happen? If you have – if you could – if you're taking a guy out of your lineup that literally most of the time cannot hit and putting in a guy that on average is one of the better hitters on your team, it's just going to change how you approach the game. It's Glavin, Smoltz, and Maddox. Chicks dig the long ball. They don't want to see bunts. And and this has not changed in in a whole generation of pitchers uh, and hitters. So, yeah, and I think, you know, we're talking about just a minute ago that how offense is down and how do we bring more offense into the game or or make it fewer strikeouts. And that's a perfect reason that DH, you know, you're going to get a better quality at bat from a DH than you will from a pitcher. That is inarguable. And that's something that you've seen. You don't have... The pitchers are really the last free outs in lineups anymore. You know, back in the day, there used to be a guy or two on the each team that was, you know, Ray Ordonez. No bat. Guy was going to hit 200 for the season and was pretty much a free out in the lineup and wasn't really a threat, even if he did occasionally get some hits. But those guys basically don't exist anymore. The only batters that are really like that on any team are the pitcher and maybe occasionally like a defensive specialist type player. That's right, and, and, and that's very true. And and so that these are what that's why pitchers don't go and pitch twenty, you know, thirty four starts, twenty eight complete games. Guys don't get three complete games in a season if they're lucky to they get it's one because you have to work so much harder because right. they're not no. you can't cruise through any outs in the lineup. And I, I so so it's weird to me that like the, the game already seems so slanted towards the hitter right now with everything that they're doing to try and slow them down that then to take away the shift too, it's just like how much scoring do we really need to have happen? Yeah, and 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 I think we both feel uh, similarly that the, the shift itself is is not the issue, and 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 making a rule for for that is would be silly at, at this point. I think I can't think of another sport that that would have changed its positioning to say, well, we're we're getting too much going. You know, hockey changes. You know, offsides sometimes that that can. Yeah, be- I could see like fo- it would be like if football decided a particular formation was illegal, and I could only see that happening. If somehow there was something specific about that formation that like exploited the uh, another rule of football that like made it impossible to stop or something, like and like 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 if you like like just to kind of explain better, like if you could like stack receivers on one another in such a way that it made it impossible for the defense to effectively cover like everything them. was a pick. <laughs> yeah, like you just like you designed pick plays with your formation basically. Yeah, yeah. Like so, like but like that's never going to happen. So it's like I and, and certainly this shift does not imply that same kind of success because even if you've moved the guy over there he has to make the play still well the nba did this right because they for years outlawed the zone defense mm. you know i mean you could play zone defense in college but i don't remember how recently but it wasn't that long ago in no. the past 10 or 15 years they mm. outlawed the zone def- they, they outlawed the outlawing of the zone defense and teams can play a zone or whatever it is and now because the guys are such good shooters there isn't a zone because the NBA just doesn't allow for that to happen. But for years you couldn't do it. And, and why? Was it that debilitating? That it made the, That's a very 
you know, bad call I thought on the NBA's yeah, part. I think the idea is that very rarely should you create rules to ban specific strategies. I think the only reason you should be doing that is if that strategy is so powerful it completely warps the game. Like, if if shifting was so powerful and, like, we saw all of a sudden because of the shift. Yeah, two runs a game came off the board. Exa- then, okay, maybe we need to think about changing it. But that's not the case. Yeah, and, and these are Major League Baseball players. And I bet you their managers would say, if we don't have the ability to adapt in situations like that, then we're not a very good baseball team. Exactly. Like, if you can't hit the ball to a completely open part of the field... I don't know what's going on. You're probably like you're a major league hitter. You could totally do that. And adapting by hitting the ball over their heads, um, hopefully into the seats for them. But you know, is is definitely the strategy that the major leaguers have employed to sort of beat the shift. And yeah. it's been reasonably effective. Exactly. You know what? Okay, you're going to put all the guys over on the right side of the field. Doesn't matter if I hit it 400 yards, uh, 400 feet out there. Yeah. Well, um, we we agree on the shift. That's that's not anything that's going to change soon. And um, we hope that uh, the MLB will just put that away and not mess with the strike zone either, because we think the game as it stands right now that way is just fine. Yeah, I think I think there is just no need to change it. I think I would rather see them if they're really concerned about too many strikeouts looking at I think outlawing strategies is never as good as maybe changing the strike zone. I agree 100 percent. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. And you can follow us on Twitter at AlmostCoop.